Welcome everybody. Bezrat Hashem. We're very happy to begin this uh, exciting journey of learning uh, the uh, process, the uh, ultimately to uh, to achieve a knowledge of Yorei De'a, the section of the Shulchan Aruch Yorei De'a, beginning at the very beginning. And I wanted to point out to all the participants that, first of all, this is a very uh, challenging course of study, even for many rabbis. Uh, most Tzmicha programs don't require Shechita as part of the, uh, as part of the uh, required study. Only the most outstanding, like Yeshivat Brisk, required uh, that kind of knowledge. So it's really a high, it's a high bar to set. And the reason why I wanted to set a high bar is because any time that you're starting anything new, any new program, you really have to prove yourselves a little bit. And so we want to be able to demonstrate that we really know our stuff and that we're not, uh, we didn't pass through easily. Um, and sometimes uh, there's so many books, so many programs, so many uh, easy ways around learning the other parts of Yorei De'a that uh, oftentimes they can be looked at as you know, within the grasp of just anyone. But we're not just anyone, we're special. So therefore, we're going to challenge ourselves by setting the bar a little bit higher than some others. But what makes it especially exciting is the practical hands-on component, which you're not going to have anywhere else. And we're very fortunate that we're going to attempt to incorporate in our learning. We're actually going to have an easy one. Well, you can either bring a friend you'd like to try it on, um, or, you know, we can discuss that later. Uh, for now, what I, I wanted to begin the uh, course with something, I don't want to call it lighter, it's actually deeper. I want to start the course by entering into the subject matter uh, from a bird's eye view, from the view of the Torah, from the view of the Tanakh, from the view of the context in which these halachot appear in the Torah, so we can understand them, not just in their technicality, but we have a framework through which to understand the significance of these halachot. And unfortunately, this is an element or a component of studying halacha, which is often neglected. So you're again at an advantage in studying it with this added element, that you're going to have not only a knowledge of the practical elements, but you're also going to have a knowledge of the uh, sort of philosophical or biblical uh, context in which they emerge and their deeper meaning, which I think is really eye-opening and fascinating. And, and the sources that I sent out to everybody included questions and included Mare Mekomot that point you in the direction of appreciating um, some of these ideas that we're going to explore tonight. I have also a syllabus for next week's class as well, because the, the uh, schedule, that the structure of how we're going to approach this as I was looking at the vastness of the material and myself feeling slightly overwhelmed how to, uh, you know, by the prospect of trying to digest this once a week over X number of months, it occurred to me that it might be a more effective strategy to divide it into a two-pronged approach, like I mentioned in the latter emails, which would be that the sources, which are the background sources, such as the Talmudic sources, the Tur, the Bet Yosef, the things that are uh, what what I would consider more the, um, the basis or the foundation of the subject, we'll do on Mondays. And, uh, and that will be recorded and available for those who can't make it twice a week, which is understandable. And then on Thursdays, we'll be in Shulchan Aruch. The goal will be to be in the actual Shulchan Aruch, the practical nitty-gritty on Thursdays. So yes, it's an advantage, a vast advantage to know both because it'll more easily comprehend and process the Shulchan Aruch. If you have all of the background, then I would urge everybody to access those shiurim, even if you can't be here live on both of the days, because it will give you a tremendous advantage uh, in understanding and uh, processing the material. However... Sorry, where are you posting them? Um, we're going to figure that out as we... Uh, by, 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 for, for the time being, the plan is only because it's the simplest for me, I'm going to put it on YouTube and, a, and in, in a private uh, setting where only people that I send the link can get it. Uh, eventually, we're going to graduate to something else because after Pesach, we're going to have our own website. We have a website designer. We got some funding, actually. Uh, it's a long story. Maybe not that long, but not, not for the sure. But we have funding to help us, uh, uh, to help us have a, a real website. So we're going to have our own website, actually, uh, which, where this will be a lot easier. People will have their own passwords to access media and so on. And we won't have to worry about, uh, about those issues of it being public because we want to keep it, not because we're elitists, just because we feel like we want value for what we're, what we're investing. So that being said, but for now, probably on YouTube. And I'll send you the links. Um, we were considering some other possibilities uh, as well. The, um, but the key is that the Mondays are going to be the background. 
Shur Beit Yosef, Talmudic sources, and the Thursdays will be the Shulchan Aruch, Shachtaz, and whatever other uh, relevant sources. And as we go through sources, by the way, I'll introduce them and present them to you so you understand what we're reading. So obviously you know what a Chumash is, what a Rambam is, what Ramban is. I don't have to tell you who those people are, but as we get further into the Shulchan Aruch and the tour, we're going to find a lot of sources that maybe you're not as familiar with. Um, you don't know who they are, you don't know the biographies of the authors and so on. And we'll touch upon that a bit as we get uh, closer uh, to that point. But for tonight, what I really wanted to start with was, where does Shechita originally uh, presented in the Torah? Where do we see it? In what context? And uh, how does the mitzvah, how did, did this mitzvah evolve? It's very interesting because this is a mitzvah that evolved historically, as some of the sources show. So we're going to start with Sefer Vayikra, jumping ahead just a few parashiyot shavua. Anybody who needs a chumash, actually, you can jump into the sanctuary and find a chumash readily available if needed. Oh, could, uh, Mo- Moshe, could you mute your mic because we hear a lot of uh, background noise from you? Yeah, a lot of scratching. Do you have any Korach Gedolot in there? Uh, no, but I, no, but I have Rambans here, copy. Oh, okay. So, but if you have, a, so if you have a Chumash, I'll give you the Ramban. Okay. Um, I've copied it out of my Ramban Haminukat mm-hmm. event. So, okay. Yudzayin. So this appears actually in Perak Yudzayin, seventeen of Vayikra, and these are Parashiot we're going to be seeing soon in Parashat Shavua cycle. And parashiot that are often not paid a terrible amount of attention because they're kind of technical and, uh, and a little bit abstruse. So let's take a look at what goes on. What we find is that really what is laid out in parashat Vayikra, I'm sorry, in parashat Aharimot, and what's also laid out in parashat Re'e are really the foundation of foundations of understanding Shechita, things that we take for granted. Of course, meat has to be nishchat, it has to be slaughtered properly and so on. I mean, it goes without saying, kashrut, that's the backbone of kashrut. Otherwise, we'd be able to eat uh, halal meat and we wouldn't need, uh, wouldn't need kosher meat. So uh, certainly, uh, it's no question, but where does this come from? So let's take a look at Perak Yud Zayin. Vayidaber Hashem and Moshe Lemor. Hashem spoke to Moshe. Daber ala Haron banav. Now, the context of this, of course, is in the Mishkan. That Vil Martalehem says, Vil Bana, the Berla Haron Vil Banav, Vil Kol Bene Israel, speak to Aharon and his sons and all of Bene Israel, Vil Martalehem, Zea Davar. This is the thing. Oh, you got lost. Asher Tziva Hashem Limor. This is the matter that Hashem commanded, saying, Ish Ish Mi Bet Israel, any person from the house of Israel, Asher Yishchat, Shor Ochesev Oez, Bamahane. Who slaughters shor a bull, kesev a sheep, or ez a goat bamahane in the camp, or asher yishchat nichutz bamahane, or he slaughters it outside the camp. In other words, he goes on a little picnic, whatever it might be. Vil petach oil moed lo hevio, and he doesn't bring it to the tent of meeting, the door of the tent of meeting. Lakriv korban Hashem lefnei mishkan Hashem to bring a korban to Hashem before the sanctuary of Hashem. Dam yachashev laishahu dam shafach. It will be considered blood for that person. He spilled blood. And that person will be cut off from these people. So that the people will bring their uh, slaughterings that they slaughter. Is really uh, a literal rendition of it. I don't know. How do they render, how do they render that in the JPS? Uh, this is in order that the Israelites may bring the sacrifices which they have been making. Okay, oh. yeah, okay, well, that's not yeah. literal. Okay, uh, all right. I was hoping for something more literal from JPS. Okay, al This is a new one. And they should bring, they, and they should bring them to Hashem. That's sometimes worse. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The King James is interesting, actually. But anyway, the uh, and they bring and they should bring it to Hashem. El petach o el la kohen to the door of the tent of meeting to the kohen. That's you. Vizavachu zibchei shelamim l'Hashem otam, and they should offer them as korban shelamim. What is a korban shelamim? What what is special about a korban shelamim? No, the opposite. No. The poor guy went for a, a, a picnic and you told him he has to fully consume his korban and burn it. That's not nice. No, the opposite. Shilamim, he gets to eat it. A shilamim is one that you get to eat almost all of it. Pretty much you get to eat all of it. Except for the chelev. So, so, so what does it say? So, so what is basically the Torah saying here? No barbecues. Bring a shalom. No barbecues. Right? The Torah is saying no barbecues. If you're going to, right, if you want to, if you're interested in meat, 
I'm reading like a simple reading. If you're interested right. in any kind of a uh, of meat, you have to have a korban shalamim, which is no real skin off your nose, because honestly, a korban shalamim essentially is taking all the things you're not allowed to eat anyway, the chelev and the blood, the fats and the blood that you're not allowed to eat anyway, putting them on the altar, you're not allowed to eat them anyway, so let them put them in the bath, what do you care, and you get to eat the meat. So really it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect your eating, of, uh, your consumption of the, cor- of the, of the meat at all. So it's, a, it's just offering the parts that could be offered on the Mizbech. So that's on the altar. So this is, the, uh, this is what the Torah is telling us. The pshat, the simple meaning is that anybody who wants to slaughter any animals for any purpose has to bring them to the, to the Mishkan. Okay, as a Korban. The Kohen shall throw the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. And he shall... Burn the fat as a as a savory smell unto Hashem. And they will no longer slaughter their offerings to the seirim. These were some kinds of uh, uh, what do you call it? Desert demons that they used to go and slaughter offerings to Hashem. Which they have they are wont to stray after. This is an eternal statute for them forever, which is not exactly true because uh, clearly when, when there's no Mishkan, they, we do not have to bring all of our animals. But meaning at that time, it was an absolute statute. So the point is, no. there seems to be here, if we, if we read this uh, in the, the simple straight reading, what we are seeing is that the Torah is telling you that if you want to have any kind of meat, you need to bring a korban to the Mishkan. Correct? And it's also saying that the reason for this was because they would go out into the Midbar and do some kind of a strange uh, communing with some sorts of demons. Not that the Jews were necessarily themselves doing that before Al in actuality at that time. They may or may not have been, but the point was that it was customary to do so. And in order to keep them away from such troublesome behavior, they were commanded to bring these, the, this meat to the Mishkan. Yes? Isn't the, wouldn't the Peshach not be any animal... We're going to see, as you see later. Sure, okay. So, well, there we go. Uh, you want to eat the meat of these? It's the animals species. that could be a korban. Yeah. That's, the, the, these that's the simple meat. Shot. Right. Any animals but that could these be. These are not birds. Yeah. It doesn't mention, doesn't mention anything but those three. We will see. Right. And to them you should say, A man of the house of Israel or of the stranger who dwells among them. Who brings a korban. Now this is kind of like the converse of what we just read. Somebody who brings a korban this time. So before, you wanted to go on a nice, you know, you were just bringing your family on a Lagba Omer barbecue, which of course they celebrated even back then, right? Because the Avot kept Lagba Omer. Right, of course. So they, 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 you wanted to have a Lagba Omer barbecue, but the problem is that Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, you have to bring the korban to the, the, to the Mishkan. But this is saying, no, you want to bring a korban. And you say, listen, I don't like the Kohanim. You know, I'm Kikola Ida Kulam Kedoshim, so says Korach, right? I don't need to bring my, I don't want to benefit the Kohen. Right? Right? So therefore, what am I going to do? I'm going to go and, and offer the Korban on my own. So he says, This is called uh, offering a Korban Bachutz. Okay, ma'ale bachutz, makdir bachutz, which means you went and you offered a korban. So it's not that you went to have a personal barbecue and it wasn't done in, on the precinct of the of, of the Beit Hamikdash or as a korban. It was that you wanted to offer a korban. Okay, and that korban was uh, was brought uh, outside of the Beit Hamikdash. I think that's mine actually doing that. So. Now, so, so there are two rules. Rule number one is you can't bring, you can't have any meat, or you can't have, you can't be slaughtering animals unless it's a korban. Rule number two is if you want to do a korban, it has to also be in the mishkan. So don't think, well, you're telling me if I want to have a personal barbecue that I have to make it into a korban, but you didn't tell me if I wanted to do a korban, it had to be in the mishkan. Maybe I can do a korban outside the mishkan. So that's why you need both, both mitzvot. Okay. Now, ve'ish ish mi bet yisrael min ager agar betocham asher yochal kol dam. Don't need any blood. Okay, so this is a little bit on a separate track, but the idea is that you can't eat any blood and, and the mitzvah of kisui hadam, which comes up later in Hilchot Shechaita, but it's very noteworthy to see that it's mentioned here not to eat blood and it says, That I, that the, the, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given you the blood for the altar, 
to be an atonement on your souls because it is through the blood that you will have atonement. Okay, that you should not eat blood because the blood belongs on the Mizbeach. So what are you seeing here as an emphasis here? The emphasis is that everything belongs on the Mizbeach. Okay? Anything that could be there should be there. Anything that can't be there is what's left for you. Okay? But anything that could be there should be there. That's basically, that's basically what the Torah is saying. And this is going to be important. And then it says, Let's say you happen to trap a wild animal, like you see Bambi running, you catch her. Or, or you catch a chicken. Perhaps more likely. This is what the, uh, in the uh, Frisco kid he was able to uh, catch. So what happens? You spill its blood. You should cover it with dirt. Now let me ask you. What would you say is the... Uh, why would I think I could eat the blood of the chicken? Or, the, or, the, or Bambi? Because it's not for a korban. Because it can't be. Because Bambi can't, can't be, be a korban. But an off can. So it's certain types of offot could. Certain types of offot could. But very, very limited number. Only bnei yonah, toru bnei yonah. But let's say toru uh, yonah. But let's say, but let's say, but but definitely the hava amina is that any animal or any type of bird, which most birds cannot be a korban, that since the Torah is telling you, don't think. I just told you that. What was the reason why you're not allowed to eat blood? Because it goes in the back. Oh, so then if I have Bambi blood, that's okay. Because deer, sorry, it sounds, it sounds terrible. It sounds right. But deer, it can't be on the Mizbeach, so therefore it must be allowed. That, that's logical. That's very logical. Right? So therefore the Torah says, no, 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 there's a separate prohibition on eating blood, you can't eat blood. And therefore, what mitzvah applies to animals? This is interesting. What mitzvah apply, What's the mitzvah? Kisui Adam. You have to cover it. What kind of what kind of creatures do you do kisui Adam? Do you do kisui Adam on uh, on a uh, on a goat? No, only on types of animals that can't be a korban. See, it's very interesting. So, so now I want you to just note that in your brain for a second. Only types of animals that can't be a korban have the mitzvah of kisui Adam. Why? Because you have, else to do with the blood. you have nothing else to do with the blood. In other words, when there's an animal... Now, remember, you're living in the Midbar for a second. Okay, you're a Jew living thousands of years ago in the Midbar. If you have an animal to slaughter, and it is a domesticated animal which could be a korban, then what is it going to be? It's going to be a korban. So therefore, where's the blood going to go? On the Mizbeach. But if you happen to catch a deer, and you want to slaughter that, where's the blood going to go? Well, it can't go on the Mizbeach because it can't be a korban, so where's it going to have to go? You have to cover it. Vechisau be'afar. Okay? That's, why the, that's what the Torah is saying here. It's saying don't think that it's only because of the Mizbeach, because really you can't eat blood even if it's not going to go on the Mizbeach, therefore it must be covered. We're just reading what we call Pshuto Shel Mikra here. This is, you'll see why this is important as we move forward. Ki nefesh kol basar Because the soul of the animal is tied up with the blood. That's the reason. So there's something inappropriate about eating the blood itself. And then, last but not least, then it talks about the nevelah and trefa, which of course are the animals that are either die without any kind of slaughter or are damaged. A trefa is a damaged animal that we'll learn a lot more about later on. But as you can see, this is the controlling parasha for many of the mitzvot that relate to shechitan and trefot. They're all here in a context which on the surface is not directly relevant to what we would call chulin. It's not directly relevant to uh, mundane animals. It's really primarily discussing the issue of korban Note, the blood of Korbanot and so on as it applied to the Jews in the Midbar. So one could ask, well why am I bringing this? But we'll see in a second. Now, and now there are a couple of the Farshim that we said we were going to take a look at here. Does anybody have the sheet in front of them? What was the citation number one? I have a question. Pasuk 21 and 22. Okay. Is there one for Rashi? <clears throat> right, okay. Is the issue that the, yeah. the, the nefesh in the blood, is, is, that, is that include... No, it can't be because this is very crowded. No, it's Does that it's include? 11. Okay. Does that include? I don't want to miss any sources. Yeah. Does that include animals that could be? Is that prohibition? Is that the, the, the idea that the nephesh in the blood you can't you can't give blood? Is that in, for the animals that can be brought to korban? Is that in addition to the prohibition of 
Oh, eating something that's consecrated. Right, there's addition. Right, so if it's a korban, so it would also be it would also be mi'ilah, or it would also be. Uh, so it's so, so for, for korban animal, it's both. Right. For everyone. <coughs> it would also be benefiting from the. It's uh, just this one. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, okay. So let's take a look. <clears throat> What did you say was for the, which Rashi did I tell you to look at? Three, okay. So right, so it was interesting to look at the Rashi here. He says, So, Rashi says, Rashi actually, like you mentioned before, is a real Pashtan. Okay? Actually, he goes more Pshat than the Pashtan. Yeah. Right? Because according to Rashi, this isn't talking about the barbecue for Lagba Omer, like I said. Rashi says, nope, this is all talking about Korbanot. It's telling you not to bring a korban outside of the mishkan, in whether it be, no matter what it be. Right. Right. In other words, it's it's really according to Rashi, both of them are talking about mukdashin. And and the door Tom actually backs up Rashi. Right. So right, that's true. So a good a good source a good basis for Rashi is that it says this is an eternal statue. He says Right. Right. But the question is, according to Rashi. The one question, the one problem is that it's, it's repetitive then. Right? Because right, then the next right, part right, says right. if a person bring Olau Zavah and he doesn't bring it so the, and he doesn't bring it nope. to the Beit HaMikdash. So what does that, he do with that? explain that by saying that. No, so Rashi says, he sees the problem. He says, Not only is it prohibited to slaughter a korban outside, Rashi says the second part is to teach you that you also can't offer can't the body offer, of the korban outside. Right. So, ah, so according to Rashi, the whole thing is about korbanot, and then you can say to me exactly what Yisrael said, which is, this is a waste of my time. Why are you teaching me about korbanot? I came here to learn about Shechitan. I'm not going to be serving in the Beit HaMikdash as a Kohen. So you wait, and it's certainly not in the Midbar Sinai. So why are we learning about this according to Rashi. Absolutely correct. Nothing to do with it. However, what does a Ramban do here? So, we have to understand that most people don't agree with that interpretation of Rashi. I just wanted you to, I wanted it to be out there because uh, it should be out there. So what does Rashi say? I'm sorry, what does Ramban say? <clears throat> and I have the Ramban if you don't have it, actually. I should hand it out if anybody doesn't have it because I realize your Chumash probably doesn't have Ramban. I only managed to, uh, to uh, staple three packets because, the, because unfortunately the uh, stapler wasn't working or ran out of staples and wasn't working. So there's one more. Here's the Ramban. Is, can, is there also like... Difference you could say, desig- like if you designate an animal for korban and you end up not giving oh, it. Oh, you have one? What did you say? If you, if you designate an animal for korban, but you end up not giving it. That's not a violation, that's a violation of passive one. Okay, so it's that's not a, not. It's not an active one. And, and you, uh, I mean, it's also, there's also, oh, you can't do that. Wait, but could that, could that be the difference between two pesukim? We we'll talked about that later. That's, a, that's in a different pesukim variant. Okay, now here's a Ramban. If anyone needs, let's take a look at the Ramban and see what he has to say about the pesukim and he, what light he sheds on it. And how it really, uh, when we when we use the Ramban, the Ramban happens to be like a phenomenal entry point into the whole area. Um, it's amazing. So. Let's take a look at what he says. And then we're going to take a look at Dvarim, and we're going to take a look at then the Gemara that I had given you to look at. Now, the Ramban, I showed you the part that we were going to look at. He says... Uh, is it backwards in here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it went, it went backwards in my, in my sheets. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, he says, Vanachon the parasha. Right? Mash is Kiru Rabotin. It's Ramban. I have it here. It's Samachtet. Samachtet, the other one. There's another Ramban. It's, uh, it's in here. Here, take this one. Take this one. It's in here. Um, the Ramban says, what is the, what is the real meaning of this whole parasha here? She'asar besar ta'aval Yisrael ba'midbar. This is what I interpreted it as before when I was reading the simple pshat without the Rashi. That Hashem prohibited besar ta'ava. What's ta'ava? Everyone's got it. Desire. Right? Desire. Taiva, we call it. Right? Besar Tava. The desirous, the meat that you want for your own pleasure. Right? Not for holy reasons. Velo rak shilamim shi asual mizbah Hashem. And they should only have korbanot that are done on the mizbah of Hashem. Ulachach amar, therefore he said, shekol mi shi yishchot, mi shloshet minea behemot, asher meyen yaviu kol korbanot. Therefore anybody. Who slaughters one of the three types of animals that can be brought as a korban? Shehem, Shor, Vechesev, Ez, which is the ox, 
the sheep, the goat, you should bring all of them to the Beit HaMikdash or to the Mishkan. That he should bring the parts that go on the Mizbeach. And then, and then he can eat the, the food. And therefore he says, if you slaughter them anywhere else, you're going to be Chayav Karet. So this is the simple Pshat. In other words, that what, what the Torah is telling you is that what Hashem said was, you're not allowed to have barbecues. Unless it's a Korban. Okay, so that's going to come up as a possibility. So let's hold on to that idea. Okay. Now, what does Rashi, what does Ramban go on to say? And what it really seems to mean by the pshat, and the Ramban is uh, usually pshat. That originally, what did the Torah prohibit? Any kind of slaughtering outside, and that's what we call the besar ta'ava. And it gives a reason. What's the reason? It's not because Hashem doesn't want you to have meat. He's, it's not because of pita. What's the reason? The reason is because he wants it to be a korban. It's a positive reason, not negative, right? It's not negative reason, a positive reason. And the vacherechen is here. And then he tells you a further thing, which is don't make your own Mizbeach. In other words, you might say, okay, very nice, Hashem. You said that I can only bring a Korban in the Mishkan. But listen, the line is ridiculous. I'm going to be here, you know, wait a week. So therefore, I'd like to make my own Mizbeach. It'll also be des- designated to God. What's wrong with that, right? It's a very fair question. If you're going to make everybody go to one central Mizbeach, you're talking about two million people. How often are you going to be eating meat? By the time you get to the end of the line, you're going to be very skinny. Okay? So therefore, so, that, so that's, it makes sense that the two are connected. Because if you're going to limit it, right, it's kind of like le havdil. Right? Some kind of communist, uh, you know, you're nationalizing the Mizbeach, but then you won't let me, I can't have my own private eating of meat, it has to be on the Mizbeach, but then you nationalize the Mizbeach, everybody has to come on one, we're going to be waiting like on those old Soviet, you know, rations lines that they used to have, waiting on all day. So it's no good. So what happens? So like they used to have in the times of the Bamot, okay? So that's, that's basically the Ramban learns the Pshutosh Mikra, that is the Pshat, simplest way of reading. Okay, now the Ramban on the other page on Ayin says that. Uh, uh, okay, and he, here he alludes to what it talks about in Dvarim, that he and we we don't have to read it so much yet because it's going to come later. But he, he he says here that it mentions those who slaughter outside. <laughs> That there's no option for personal meat eating outside of the uh, of the Mishkan in the Midbar. Like as we saw in Parashat Re'e, what what is the Torah's reason for allowing people to slaughter meat anywhere that they want? It's because they're too far from the Mishkan. Ask a person who lives in Haifa. Every time he wants to have a piece of bologna, he has to go all the way to Yerushalayim. And it's not going to work. Right, so, that's so therefore, she are chayiv. Ah, so what does he say? dato shel Rabbi Yishmael. This is the opinion, as we saw, as we're going to see, of Rabbi Yishmael in the Talmud, um, as we're going to see uh, in, uh, uh, you know, very shortly as we look at the Gemara. So, paparashiyot alalu. Umikan amar, based on this he said, temi'ikara itzalu besar ta'ava, that initially... Besar ta'ava was prohibited. You weren't allowed to have any kind of meat for your own use. In other words, in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, the analogy to being in the Midbar was... See, in the Midbar, everyone centered around the, uh, around the Mishkan, so, you have, so you're all considered like part of the campus of the Mishkan, so to speak. But when you're in Israel, you're not all considered part of the campus of the Mishkan. Unless you're in, on the precincts of the Beit HaMikdash, you are not allowed to have your own barbecue. No matter how hungry you are. Okay, so there is still a remnant of the Chukat Olam. Okay? Now, this is the Ramban here. Let's take a look at the Varim. We'll take a look at the Ramban over there. And then we're going to look at the Gemara and we're going to see something fan- fantabulous. Okay? But let's first take a look at the, uh, what the Gomash what the tells us in Parashat Re'e, which is very famous uh, change, of course, that the Torah takes in Perak Yud Bet. Now, just as a, of course, we know that the Parakim in the Torah have absolutely nothing to do with what Hashem intended, but that doesn't, you know, we don't, we're not learning the Chumash to learn it 
uh, completely, really it starts from Pasuk Kaftet in uh, Perak Yud Aleph, which is Vayaki Yavyachashem Adorecha Ela Aretz Sherata Vasham Alirishta. When you shall come to the land that Hashem has given you to inherit, this is not directly germane to what we're talking about, but the blessings and curses on the mountains there, it tells us exactly where they are. And then, Lamed Bet, and very wisely, somebody thought that that was a good place to end the chapter when really it's the introduction to the next part. Yeah. Right? But they do that all the time. He had a very, like he divided out the seven. Right, day. they do that all the time. Right. Right. So these are the laws that you have to keep when you come to the land. I'm reading it quickly. So bet is basically bet, gimel, dalid, hey, talk about you got to get rid of all these alien sanctuaries. When you come to Israel, it's full of Avodah Zarah. There's idolatry everywhere under every tree and on every stone, every mountain, and it's all kinds of altars to every god imaginable, and you've got to eliminate them. And then it says, Don't do this to Hashem your God, which, by the way, is a double meaning. It means don't destroy anything that belongs to God. God forbid that you shouldn't erase. That's the, the prohibition of destroying or erasing God's name or anything, uh, anything holy. And then it also means don't have multiple sanctuaries to God. Okay, that's also machloka between Rambam and Ramban, what the pshat is in, in the psukim. But that's not our direct topic today. Only in the place that God choo- chooses of all of your tribes, to place his name there, you should seek his presence and come there. That means that there should be one central place of worship. You can't have 50, 100, 1,000 different mizbechot around Israel. You should bring their olotechem v'zivchaychem v'edmasrotechem. You should bring your burnt offerings. Your zivchaychem is the Torah often uses that term to mean shilamim. In other words, the one that you eat the meat v'edmasrotechem. Your maser offerings, every tenth animal that comes under the stick is given to Hashem. That's maser. V'et trumat yedchem. And the offerings of your hands, etc., etc. These are all the korbanot. In other words, anything that you have which is called mukdashim, anything which is a sanctified animal, a korban, must be brought to a central place. You can't say, hey, the, the Kna'anim had lots of different places. It's good for business, you know? Competition is good for business. You have multiple places open up. You can go to different places. Maybe the customer service is a little bit better in the Haifa Beit HaMikdash, you know, or whatever. So you, 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 can't, you can't do that. It has to be centralized. You eat there before Hashem. You got usmachtem and be happy. Bechol neshlach yedchem, atem ovatachem. Hashem erach Hashem erach. So as God has blessed you, so enjoy. You enjoy yourself. Come. Lo tasun gechol Hashem. Nachnu asim po ayom ishkol Hashem benav. Don't do everything like the way that you want to do it. Okay. In other words, you can't do whatever's right in your eyes like we do today. Now there's a big discussion. What exactly is he talking about? What were they doing that was so bad? You know, then the Farshim discussed. What does he mean? But okay, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, there's a lot of interpretation. I don't want to go into it right now. But let's go forward to uh, Pasuk. Okay, it reiterates this place is where you have to bring all of your korbanot, usmachtem, and then Yud Gimel. Be careful not to offer your offerings in any place that you see. Okay? This is verse Yud Dalit, verse 14 actually. You should go to the place that God chooses in one of your tribes. That's where you should offer your offerings, and that's where you should do what I command you. Now, what is the Torah going to say now? This is this is Yud Bet Tedvav. Yeah, Yud Bet Tedvav. So, Rag Becholavat Nafshechana, you tell me what is the relevance of this to what we just learned. We just learned a very emphatic uh, the concept that there are many different places that when the Jews arrived in the land of Israel, there were many, many different places of, set up for worship. You have to eliminate those. Don't set up a comparable system of multiple places of worship, but rather have one place of worship. And then the Torah says, don't, and don't offer in any place. Rag Becholavat Nafshechat Vasar, but anywhere you want. Okay? To, at your heart's desire, you can slaughter and eat meat. According to the blessing that God gave you in all of your gates. You could be impure, you could be pure. Just like animals that are chayot. In other words, your animals that you slaughter in Tel Aviv, for example, are not considered to be holy. 
You could slaughter an animal in Tel Aviv. It'll be just like the tzvi, just like your deer. Okay? Just like the, uh, what do they call ayal in uh, English? It's a, uh, what? It's a heart? Heart. Heart, right. So, uh, right. So, so the, um, kayala, right. So, so, yeah. So the, um, so, rak adam lo So, so what is the, what is the chidush here? First of all, what's the chidush? What's the, what, the Torah is following a logic here. What is the Torah saying? What's the logic here? Moshe Rabbeinu is giving a speech to the people, exhorting them on this. What's the, what's the logic? Now he's telling you, you can slaughter animals in any place. What was your, what was your hava amina before? But you couldn't, unless you were bringing a korban. The only place you could bring a korban was a mikdash. You just went on 10, 20 psukim telling me, don't slaughter in every place, don't slaughter in every place, don't slaughter in every place, right? And now all of a sudden you tell me what? So what might you think? Oh! It's going, to, it's going to be just like in the old days. Just like when we were in the Midbar. We have to go only to the Bet HaMikdash. But, but it's what the animals, which animals is, is he talking about? That's Any kind. No, but he just, the animals that he's mentioning now are different animals than he was mentioning before. No, it's saying that they're going to be Katzavi V'chaya. Okay. Right? But so, in other words, it means that you can now, you no longer have any restrictions. In other words, you might have thought, oh, you're telling me don't offer in any place. Just like you told me in the Midbar. We just read in Vayikra. Don't go offering Korbanot outside. Oh, it, everything has to be only in the central place. Well, if it has to be in the central place, maybe that also means I can't do a barbecue in my house. Maybe that also means I can't do any kind of meat processing outside of the Beit HaMikdash like it was in the, in the, in the Midbar. So that's why he says, no, 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 but you can have personal meat wherever you want. This, this. So in other words, because you might have thought, oh, up till now we've been associating the two. They're the same. I mean, a korban. There's no such thing as eating meat, Ella, except for a korban, right? That's been the rule up till this, now. This undermines Rashi's... For, yeah, we're putting aside Rashi because definitely not the... That's, he's the Pshat according to nobody. So, right. you know, I, I can't do that. We can't cover every Pshat. So let's... We're sticking with the main, main one. So, but according to like the way pretty much everybody learns it. Okay. So what the Torah is saying is up till now you've been identifying meat with Korban. There's no in-between. And meat eating with Korban. Meat eating with Korban and meat with Korban. So therefore now you're telling me you, you can't offer a Korban in any old place. Well, if I can't offer a Korban in any old place, what does that mean? That I shouldn't be able to have a barbecue in any old place either because isn't it the same thing? So therefore the Torah is telling you, no. According to whatever your desire, you can eat in any place. And you don't have to think it's something holy, just like the way that you eat a deer and you don't have to be tahor to eat a deer because it's not a Korban. You don't have to be tahor to eat your uh, 999 hot dogs or whatever. But hold on. Brands, I, I, I want to get some advertising money. In Vayigra, we had two pesukim, one just for Shechita and one for Korbanot. So right. we already had the distinction before. What do you mean? We had the distinction. One for Chulin and one for Korbanot. So now the Torah is saying, Korbanot, the rule still applies. So you might say, oh, well, if Korbanot, the rule still applies, that you have to only go to the central place, maybe that oh. means also that oh, the rule Hulin. still applies about Hulin. Right. Okay. So no, 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 that you're allowed to do. So it's a change of policy coming out of the, uh, coming out of the central office here. Okay? Rak adam lo tochelo. However, Adam, so what might you think then? Ari says, Ari was always a troublesome guy in the back of the class. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, well, you don't have the rule. Remember the rule that we had about that everything had to be a korban and all that? Well, we're lifting the rule because now it's going to be too hard. So Ari, of course, says, oh, well, if it's not a korban anymore, and therefore you're saying that all, these, uh, all of these, these animals that are being slaughtered in uh, Tel Aviv and all over the place, they don't have to be brought as a korban, so we can eat the blood then, right? Because you're saying that they no longer have, they're no longer korbanot. And what was the whole reason we weren't supposed to eat the blood of those animals? Because they belong in the Mizbeach. Oh, so now, but now you're telling me they don't have to go in the Mizbeach. Ah, so therefore, if I want to have one of those, you know, dishes that they put blood, you know, some cultures, they, they cook with blood and all that. Yeah, now we can do it. So that, therefore, the Torah says, no, Rakadam lo tochelo. You still have to spell out the blood. Ala aretz tishpechenu kamay. Okay, very interesting. It doesn't say do kisui hadam. It doesn't say cover the blood. It says spill it out. You don't have to spill it out like water. You don't have to cover it. You don't have to cover it. You don't have to cover it. Right. So with, right, you could, but meaning there's no mitzvah. So with a deer, you actually have to cover it. Because the deer's blood, the logic behind it, I'm just giving what they call ta'amad ikra. Okay? The reasoning behind it would seemingly be that a deer's blood never had a chance to be a korban. 
Then we're at a chance. That blood, blood of a deer never, ever, ever goes on the Mizbeach. But if you take a sheep and you slaughter the sheep, it could have been a contender, man. Could have been a korban. But you, living in Haifa, didn't feel like schlepping over to the Beit HaMikdash and making a korban, so therefore you slaughtered it in your house. So it could have been blood. So covering it is like saying it never could have been. Leaving it uncovered is spilling it out is saying, ah, it could have been v'shafachet damo ala mizbeach. Right? It could have been on the altar, but instead it's here. So <coughs> This doesn't say that you have to cover the blood of the, of the deer or the... <coughs> it says in a vaikra that we read before. Right, but here it says it's but, just but, but, the press, it's right next to each other. But it doesn't mention actually slaughtering the deer here. Here it just mentions that you don't have to be tahor to eat the meat, just like you don't have to be tahor to eat the meat of the deer. <coughs> so it's not mentioning the blood of it. <coughs> You're right, though. Now, lo tuchal lechol bisharecha masar de ganacha v'toshcha v'tzarecha v'cholo b'kanacha v'tzonecha v'chol nederecha sher tidor v'nederotech v'tzrat yadecha. Now again, don't make a mistake. That's not to say that if you have a korban, as Ari asked before, what if I have a korban and I decide, hey, I take it back. I don't want this to be a korban. I'll eat it in my house. No, nope, you cannot do that. That you have to bring In other words, that you have to bring to the Bet HaMikdash. So, what is the, so the first thing that the Torah tells us here, and it's very important, is that, don't be, that there's no contradiction between saying that all korbanot must be brought to the central Bet HaMikdash and saying that a person may have meat slaughtering going on outside of the Bet HaMikdash. There's no contradiction. And that's why the Torah first says, don't have uh, korbanot anywhere else, but you can have your own meat anywhere else, but don't have korbanot anywhere else, right? It emphasizes it again. It's not a contradiction. Now, in the next passage here, it would seem redund- redundant on the surface, because it says, Ki yarchiv Hashem when Hashem expands your borders, kasher diber lach v'yamata ochla basar, and you say, like Ari says every day, ochla basar, I want to eat meat. He loves meat. Right? Because you have a desire. With all the desire of your heart, eat the meat. Don't feel bad about it. Don't feel guilty. Because the place that Hashem has chosen to place His name is far from you. And we are on verse 21. You shall slaughter me. Very important line. Okay? You shall slaughter it as I commanded you. And you should eat in your gates with all the desire of your heart. In other words, you shouldn't hold back. Enjoy it to the fullest. And then it goes on to repeat what we saw before, that just the same way that you eat the deer and the heart, the same way, you can eat it the same way, meaning you don't have to be tahor. It's not a korban. Just don't eat the blood. Now, didn't we see this already? And then in yeah. Pasuk, then in Pasuk Kavav, it says, Only the Korbanot you have to bring to the Beit HaMikdash. And in 27, That you have to bring. So what's going on? It's a little repetitive. Is it repetitive? Right. That's talking about Korban Shalami. Right. So Korban sh- so it, it, it again says, you can eat as much meat as you want. However, Kadashecha, if you have Korbanot, you must bring them up to the central place that we said before, and you have to offer them there, and you have to, uh, and, and everything has to go on the Mizbeach, as we already said, and don't eat the blood. Well, we just <clears throat> read before this was that you could slaughter it outside of the but this is saying that there's a special way to slaughter it, you got to do it. Right, that's true. So that's, that, the new thing is kasher tzeviticha, for sure. But there, it's even more than that, because in the previous, par, in the previous parashia, the previous section, the concern of the Torah is different. The concern of the Torah is will ha- allowing slaughter in various places compromise the centrality of the Bet HaMikdash because we just emphasized to you how important it is. Moshe Rabbeinu just emphasized how important it is that only, only, only the central Bet HaMikdash should be a place where korbanot are brought and you should not have multiple outposts. So therefore you might think you can't have multiple outposts and boy would that be easier for the Vad, you know, if they didn't have to supervise you know, all these meat restaurants so they would be very happy. So, the, uh, so, the, so you don't have multiple outposts because in other words you might think it's going to compromise so the first half of the discussion is really dealing with the problem of a 
threat to the centrality of the Beit HaMikdash. The second piece is not talking about the threat to the centrality of the Beit HaMikdash, but the inyan itself of eating meat that is not a korban. The legitimacy of eating meat that is not a korban. Independently of whether that is or isn't going to take away, is or isn't going to confuse people and make them think that they can bring a korban outside of the Beit HaMikdash. It's okay, well, it, so that's a, that's a separate issue. Now we're talking about the concept itself of eating meat outside the Beit Hamikdash and the the legitimacy of that. And that's why it says, when Hashem expands your borders, you can eat bechol avad nefshecha. Don't say, I feel guilty. I really shouldn't do this, and I really should bring it as a korban. No, there's no guilt involved. It's a blessing that Hashem has expanded your borders, and you don't have to bring. It. And therefore, but, however, the key term is kashet tziviticha. And there's a very famous, of course, many uh, kiruv uh, 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 shiurim are built on the words kashet tziviticha. And uh, I saw rolling of eyes. No. Please. Uh, no. So, uh, so that, it's based on Rashi, right? Or on the Chazahal. Rashi, that's Rashi. Kashet tziviticha. Lamanu sheish tzivu b'zvicha yachich shchot v'en elchot shechaytash nemur l'moshe v'sinai. Because everyone says, what does it mean kashet tziviticha? doesn't say anywhere in the written Torah. That it, how to how to slaughter, and therefore this is a suggestion, this is an intimation, this is a uh, an indication that there were oral laws. Because what is the Torah saying when it says oral? When it says like I commanded you, I'll tell you a better example. By the way, if you ever are trying to be mekarev somebody, and this worked actually with a when I was approached by a J witness one time, and this actually made them. Uh, I really got them for clamped. As I said, you know, it says in the... Uh, I, I, this is better than Kashet Tzivitikha. I, I because Kashet Tzivitikha, we're going to see the Ramban doesn't believe in that interpretation at all. The, um, the, uh, it says in Parashat Shoftim that if somebody is... Uh, is Im bin hakot rasha, if the bad person is worthy of, of lashes, the piloa shofet v'yikau lefanav k'dei v'yishato b'mispar, that the shofet, the judge, should bend him down and he should, he should whip him according to the 40 lashes or the 39 lashes that we give, right? So I asked the uh, Jay Witness, who they don't believe in the Torah Shabbat, they, they, that's one of their things to get Jews. They say, you know, that oral tradition is not true. I said, who's worthy of lashes? Who's Im bin Hakot Rasha? Who, who is it? Because it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah who's supposed to get makot. It's only Torah Shabbat. That for sure there's no other pshat than that there must have been Torah Shabbat because how did they know uh, Imbin HaKot Rasha? It's saying if he's worthy of lashes well, how am I supposed to know that? It doesn't say in the Torah. They said well it must say somewhere in another book. I said it does. It's called the Talmud. Anyway, so the um, <clears throat> so in any case so the, so the Ramban here a very important Ramban very, very important. Is there a third, another one on, on Mezuzah? I know the word Tothafot has no Hebrew. Oh, Tothafot. There's, there's other ones. That's a good one. I mean, you can, you can argue other ones that are finer arguments, like what is the definition of Melacha? If you don't have Torah Shabbat, how can you put someone to death? What, I think it's work to kick a soccer ball and you think it's this, you know? You can, you can, you can find other examples, but I think that in Bin HaKot is very obvious because it never says who's worthy of lashes and it says it, it, it presumes. How do, you, how do you explain all this repetition? Which Let one? Let me explain all this repetition. Which repetition? Um, versus, uh, so came, uh, uh, you design through um, your tet, match, pretty much in, in a number of details, cut above. No, you're right. I, I think that there, there is repetition here. And in each parashia, it's, it's taking it from a different angle. The same, it's packaging it from a different angle. Now, is there, is there a reason for the nuances? I'm sure, but I don't want to get too lost in the nuances of Sukkim, but I agree, there's repetition. Yeah. You can see, the main thing to notice is that the context is different, that the first context is really trying to establish the centrality of the Beit HaMikdash and say that don't think that it's a threat to the centrality of the Beit HaMikdash that people are going to slaughter outside of the Beit HaMikdash. It's not, a, it's not a threat, and you shouldn't perceive it as a threat, and it's no problem, and we, we don't consider it to compromise the centrality. The second issue is, is there an of itself any problem moral, ethical, or philosophical with a person having bizarre Okay. Okay? And then the question becomes, okay, even so, that's not a license to have a korban outside the Beit HaMikdash. Okay. In other words, so, it's, so yeah, it's coming back to the same ideas, but from a different angle. Okay. You see? Because you might say, well, if I'm going to slaughter animals anyway, and I can't get on that, that gold dome is blocking me, you know, so why can't I just do it here? It's a good, it's a good argument. Now, the, uh, so the Ramban here. Uh, 21. Yeah, I gotta find it in the. I wanted to use these sheets here, but my sheets are confusing me. 
Um, mem Chet. Okay. So yeah. Mem Chet in the Ramban. Do we have extra sheets? Oh. There are sheets here, but they're, they, they're discombobulated because they didn't state more correctly. Um, this looks like Ramban. Yeah, you're fine. It's fine. You're, 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 you're a professor. You've you got to be able to do it. All right. So, um, okay. So now, Ramban. So, Aval Perusha Katuf. Here is the explanation. Ki Yisrael nitztavu ba midbar lizboch kol bagram atzorah meshelamim lefnei hamishkan. Aval beze makom shi hamishkan yase ota. So that's, first of all, the point is that in the, in the Mishkan, they were obligated to bring any korban or any animal that they wanted to slaughter to the Mishkan, but they didn't have any obligation of korbanot, the Ramban says. There was no obligation of personal korbanot in the, in the Bidbar. That's just somewhat of a side point that is just interesting to know. The main point is on the next page, which is Memtet. He says, <clears throat> He says, that the end, he says, first of all, don't think, because it says, Ki yirhak makom. Okay? That because the Mishkan is very far from you, therefore you're allowed to eat meat, that people living in Jerusalem are not allowed to eat meat. Right? Why? It's not so far. Close! What's the problem? He says, no, no, no. It means once that it's trying to distinguish, the Ramban says, between a situation in which people are literally camped around the Mishkan. And a situation where people are living in a city that happens at the Beit HaMikdash in it. It's not the same thing, says the Rambach. Okay? And then in Kaf Aleph here, we really get to the heart of the matter, the most important thing of all. Vetam kasher tziviticha. What does it mean when it says kasher tziviticha? That I, as I commanded you, where does it say what it... So, and he quotes, of course, the Chazal that, the, that, uh, that, the, uh, that Rashi alluded to, which is, Al peh mehalacha lemoshem Sinai. This is what God commanded orally to Moses at Sinai, which is the simanim that have to be that have to be cut. Uh, that means the esophagus and the trachea. Esophagus is veshet, kane is trachea, windpipe. Okay, that that you have to have two of them sliced in an animal and one sliced in a bird. Okay, that's halacha. So. That is what the Ramban says. He says, however, the Ramban is going to give us a different interpretation. Okay? So he says, Okay? He tells you what Shechita means. Now take a look at the next, the next side. So now he says, This is, I'm on this part. Up here. Second side of Memtet. That everything that they originally ate had to be korban shalamim beim shechutim kemishpat korbanot, and they had to be slaughtered like the way of a korban. Veata kesheba leatir besaracholim, and now Hashem is coming to give you a license to slaughter animals that are not korbanot. So what does it say? Vezavachta mi bekarcha umitzonecha kasher tziviticha. You should slaughter them. Like I commanded you, and now the Ramban adds two words: Bihyotam korbanot. Like I commanded you when they were korbanot. In other words, the Ramban says you don't need to make reference to any Torah Shabbat Peh here. Why? Because it doesn't mean kasher tiviticha like I commanded you orally. It means like I commanded you regarding korbanot that you have to slaughter from the throat. Okay. It says that. Because Shechita means, the Ramban said right before, Shechita is the throat, Nechira is from the neck. Do we have the red doc here? Or Arifa. Do we have the, the uh, I might have it in my office. I think Nechira was puncturing the... It could be, it could be any. Puncturing the esophagus. Ellie, Ellie was saying it, it's puncturing from the neck. From the neck, usually. Usually it's from the neck. Ellie was saying it's puncturing yeah, as opposed yeah, to yeah. slash. So, so he says, V'tochal otam chulim. So the Ramban's interpretation of Kasher Tziviticha is very, you know, uh, uh, very controversial because it goes against you know this very enshrined belief that kasher tziviticha means like I commanded you in the Torah Shabbat Peh. The Ramban says actually what, literally what it means in the pshat is like I commanded you with korbanot. In other words, when they were korbanot, you had to do shechita. You couldn't just kill it however you want, shoot it or whatever. So the same thing is you have to slaughter it kasher tziviticha. Don't I'm not changing the way that you slaughter it. I'm just telling you that it doesn't have to be a korban. But we didn't get the details with the korban either, did we? He's not denying that there's Torah Shabbat Peh about shechita. He's just saying that might not be what the word means. <laughs> it's not necessary. <laughs> Right. To understand In other words, that might not be what kasher tziviticha means. I know. 
I'm just giving an example of stance because right. you're just trans you're just translating it one step out. Right. Right. Go back. No, no, I know, I know. But uh, now there's a lot more Ramban here, and because we're already running along, I don't want to go into the whole Ramban, even though it's really interesting well, and very part, fascinating. The part, the part that I think is important okay. is he says is because he cites that the the whole thing about Ophim because he says it. Right, he mentions that the Torah Shabbat. So he, he mentions that as being that right. the same part of the Torah Shabbat. The Torah Shabbat that that's, the, that's what. But then he says you don't really have to come on to Torah right, Shabbat. Right, right. So then he goes into the Tzvi Ayal and what that means really. And that, and I don't want to get in too far into the Ramban because I want to do something even more fundamental than that, which is get to this piece of Gemara so we can conclude soon because I don't want to keep here all night, even though I'd love to. I'd love to be here all night learning with you until the morning. But I, I know that you have families and other things to attend to. So, the, um, so uh, in any case, so far what we see is a prohibition on animals uh, outside of this context of Korban. And then we have a resurgence of the idea of partaking of animals outside the context, t- context of Korban. And you have the Ramban here who is very interestingly saying to us that when the Torah says Kashet Tziviticha, that you should slaughter animals Kashet Tziviticha, which is, by the way, that is the mitzvah of Shechita. That's the only place that the mitzvah of Shechita appears. Vizavahta Kasher Tziviticha. Thou shalt slaughter as I commanded you. The Ramban is saying, what does it mean as I commanded you? If we were to translate that according to the Ramban, it means you should slaughter your animals the same way I commanded you to slaughter korbanot. That's what the Ramban is saying it literally means. And we're going to see that there's a very strong basis for this in other halachot as we move forward. So let's take a look at a little piece of Talmud. I know the little piece of Talmud is a challenge um, for some of you to follow in the language, but it's not that hard in concept. It's, it's not too hard. This is in, um, this is in uh, Hulain. It's 16b, I believe, is the, is the English, right, number? But I'm just reading it from the Hebrew here because I am English. I'm not good at English. I, uh, so I, I can't do the English. So, and you have the Steinfeld too, which is nice. Steinfeld is good. So in anyway, in any case, what we find is something really, really noteworthy and remarkable. And then we're going to see the Rambam ways on this too, uh, ways on, in on this issue. We have a, uh, a big, what we call, dispute or machloikis, machloket, between Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva in understanding this entire thing that we just learned tonight. Okay? Now, what is, what is the Machloket? Now, the Ramban explicitly told us, the Ramban foreshadowed to us in the book of Vayikra that he was following in all of this the Pshat of Rabbi Ishmael, which is very nice because Rabbi Ishmael is actually in certain ways easier to read into the Psukim, and the Ramban is correct that that's the easiest way to read the Psukim. Okay? But we're going to see it's a, it's a, it's a Machloikis here. So what does the, Ram, what is the, what is the Gemara say? that um, we don't even have to figure out what the, the context is not as significant as cutting to the chase, okay? Rabbi Ishmael, this is Rabbi Ishmael. Now, what, the reason why the Gemara came on to this, huh? Sorry, one line. Line, I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, about twelve lines from the bottom. The question was, it said the words, Le'olam shohatin. we always do shechita. The Gemara says, Man tana. who is the Tana that says we always do shechita? Amar Rabba, Rabba said, Rabbi Ishmael, it's certainly Rabbi Ishmael. Detanya, as the Brayta teaches, Ki yarchi v'shem alohecha et givu lecha, kasher diber lach, v'yamarta uchela v'asar, that when God will expand your borders and thou shalt say, I want to eat meat. Okay, as we just read, that's in uh, Parashat. Re'e, what does Rabbi Ishmael say? Rabbi Ishmael says, Rabbi Ishmael omer lo baha katuv, scripture has not come. But to permit for them the pleasurable meat. What does that mean? Because as we saw in Parashat Acharimot in the beginning, they were not permitted to have meat that they wanted to enjoy. It was not allowed. And then what happened? <coughs> Once they entered into the land, they were allowed to eat meat as they desired. Now that they've been exiled from the land of Israel, perhaps you will suggest that it should return to its, its original 
state of prohibition because we are not in the land of Israel. Maybe it was only in the land of Israel you're allowed to have meat. Maybe outside the land of Israel we shouldn't be able to have meat. The answer is no. That's why it says we always have shechita. In other words, according to Rabbi Ishmael, basically, as we're going to see, I'm foreshadowing a little bit Rabbi Akiva's position, but according to Rabbi Ishmael, there was never a time in Jewish history where it was kosher to have meat that wasn't slaughtered according to shechita. There was never such a time. Okay, so therefore, Le'olam Shochatin is correct. You always had to do Shechita in the Midbar. You always had to do Shechita in Israel. You have to do Shechita today. So Rabbi Ishmael says, however, the Gemara says, wait a second. Matkifla Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef raised an objection, as he often does in the Talmud. Hai, Le'olam Shochatin. Le'olam Shochatin ve'ochelein mi ba'ilei. Why does it say Le'olam Shochatin? It should say we always do Shechita and eat. We'll see why he says this in a second. Okay. He says, moreover, what was the whole reason why Hashem allowed the Jews who came to the land of Israel to eat meat without having to go to the Mishkan? It was because they were too far. So now we're in exile. What, you would think that now we should have to go to the Mishkan? It doesn't make any sense, my friend. That's a, that, that doesn't make any sense. Wait, so, sorry. In other words, the Gemara was saying that Rabbi Ishmael is the one who said the Olam Shochatin, right. that you always have to slaughter. Why? Because since he says that slaughtering always applied before, maybe now you'll think that you can't slaughter, uh, you're not allowed to slaughter animals and eat them. In Galut. In Galut, because we're not in Israel, and it only said in Israel. So he says, but wait a second, number one, it doesn't say you can always slaughter and eat, meaning according to, according to that, the real key point is that you would never be allowed to eat meat. At all. According to, if, if being in exile means you can't eat meat. Right? That would, number one. Number two, um, number two, according to Rabbi Ishmael, what, what would the logic be that the prohibition should return after they leave Israel? Things are even worse now. We don't even have a Mishkan. Right. So, right? so therefore the Gemara says, we're going to dispose of that opinion and we're going to go to the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. Because Certainly today we're too far from the Mishkan. Ella Amar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Akiva. Rather it's Rabbi Akiva. Now the point here is not to understand what they're bringing Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva to prove, but rather just to understand the positions of Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva respectively. Now, what is the position? Detani as it says in the Brayta. Ki yirhak mi mechamakom. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Lo Bahakatuv, scripture has not come. Ella, is that what it says? Scripture, probably in English, right? Ella, Le Esor Lahen, Besar Nehira. You see, Rabbi Akiva turns everything that we learned so far a little bit upside down. He says, No, no, you misunderstand. What, was, what happened was that in the Midbar, you didn't have to do Shechita. Who said you had to do Shechita? He only said that for Korbanot. Well, what are you talking about, Rabbi Akiva? No, this is... Uh, you're going to see. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. So, uh, so what does he say? Because, he says, Shebatchila, Hutalen Basar Nechira. Because in the beginning, you were allowed to eat non-slaughtered meat. Mishinich Nesular, Tnesalen Basar Nechira. And then, when they came to Israel, they weren't allowed to do that anymore. Okay? So... Very interesting. So therefore you might think, now that we're in exile, we should allow, be allowed to do it again. Because we're not in the land of Israel. So, ah, that's why it has to teach you, you always have to slaughter. So what's the point? Rabbi Akiva has what sounds like a totally counterintuitive and bizarre interpretation of everything that we read in the Torah, which is that we understood all that we read as being very logical and made, made a lot of sense. You're not allowed to have barbecues, you're not allowed to eat meat unless you bring it as a korban. That's what it sounds like it says. And now you're going to the land of Israel and you're allowed to eat meat whenever you want. That's what it sounds like it said, correct? Ah, Rabbi Akiva says, no, 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 no. That's not what it means. What it meant was, you can't do shechita unless it's a korban. You want to eat meat? It's not necessarily what Rashi says, but it's in that's the Rashi. way right. that Rashi... You could read it. Rashi as That's interpreting... Rashi's right. You could Because Rashi says the whole thing is talking right. about... Right. Uh, so, 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 so he does agree with Rashi doesn't Akiva. explicitly say it, but what he's implying is implying. Because we're only talking about... That's right. That's the implication. That he's going exactly. with Rabbi Akiva. But, but he's not <laughs> explicit about it. But then that leads to the Ramban, which is... Kind right. Of right. Well, the Ramban, yeah. Ramban is definitely holding like Rabbi Ishmael. Yeah, he's right. definitely... Okay? Right. Now, now, what happens here is... Okay, according to Rabbi Akiva, it's very strange. Let's say Tom... Says, I want to have this. Uh, I want to have this sheep for dinner tonight, but uh, I don't really feel like doing shechita, so I can just chop off its head and eat it for dinner. I don't have to do it. I don't have uh, in the midbar. But wait, don't you have to bring it as a korban? No, because I hold like Rabbi Akiva, and, uh, and and according to Rabbi Akiva, the only thing I'm not allowed to do is do shechita on the animal. Well, what kind of law is that? You can't do shechita on an animal. You can only kill it any other way. 
It's a strange idea. And then when they came to Israel, oh, now you're only allowed to do Shechita. So actually, according to Rabbi Akiva, it became more strict when they came into the land of Israel, not more lenient. Right, right. Okay? Because when they were in the Midbar, you could shoot the animal and eat it. You just couldn't do Shechita unless it was a Korban. No, no Shechita. Shechita is prohibited. It was kind of like in the, where is it, the Netherlands or whatever. Yeah. Right? You're not allowed to do Shechita. But now that you came to the land of Israel, you can only do Shechita. Wait, but it was really easy just shooting the animal before with a bow and arrow. Sorry, you can't do that anymore. According to Rabbi Akiva, it got worse for them when they came in. Okay? Ah, it's interesting. Now, hold on. So, now the Gemara asks, Mai kami palgi. What is the machloikis? What is the argument between Rabbi Akiva and the Rabbi Yishmael? So, I have to translate. Occasionally I translate for you. You know, I want it to be uh, understandable to everyone. Like it says in the Megillah, you know, Medina <coughs> Medina. Every, every, every nation according to its uh, language. Right. Yeah. So, Rabbi Akiva savar besarta valoitzar klal. Rabbi Akiva said, there was never a problem having meat. You want meat? Have meat. It's no pro- there was never a concept of a prohibition on besar ta'ava, on meat for pleasure. No such thing. Okay? Rabbi Ishmael said, And Rabbi Ishmael said, There was never a time that you could eat meat that wasn't slaughtered properly. Ah, oh, so now you come to an impasse here because what was the change then? So therefore, so, so Rabbi Ishmael and the, the, the Gemara goes through, well, and, it, and it's interesting to look at the back and forth. I mean, how do they understand the different Pesukim and how do they understand the, the different ideas here and what's the status of, uh, according to Rabbi Ishmael, according to Rabbi Akiva, if you had shot the animal with a bow and arrow and then you brought that meat into the land of Israel, would it become prohibited when you entered the precincts of the land of Israel? Or would it still be, uh, you know, would it still be permitted because at the time that it was done, it was permitted? So that's what Rabbi, of course, Rabbi Rabbi Yirmiya always asks, you know, um, in the Talmud, he's famous, right, he's, he, he, he's famous for asking such uh, questions. It's like the question of here, whether you're allowed to bring from Baltimore, uh, kosher meat becomes prohibited when it comes into Rockville. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a gezerah. Yeah, but our foods. <coughs> we have that too. These two positions aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's see. They are. Because the way it works is like this. According to Rabbi Ishmael, so let's just put it out. We don't have to look at all. Okay, they go back and forth trying to understand, well, what is Rabbi Akiva really? How would he explain this halakha? How would Rabbi Ishmael explain this din? Uh, and we can look at it, uh, and you can look at it on your own time, but I don't want to go too into the details because it's not important. I just want to, let me just try to summarize very simply what the basic difference is. According to Rabbi Ishmael, there was never a time that the Jews were allowed to eat meat that wasn't slaughtered with shechita. Never. What was restricted in the Midbar was that you weren't allowed to eat any meat other than a korban. Okay? There was no personal meat eating. So therefore, (laughs) until they came to Israel. Of, of, of animals that could be korbanak. Of animals that could be korbanak. No, that's Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Akiva says, no, no, no. There were two right. different types of meat. Right. If you wanted to do... If for some reason you wanted to do shechita, it had to only be a korban. That was korban only. You want to bow and arrow your animal? You want to bludgeon it? I don't know. Whatever you want to do? That might not be nice, but it's fine as long as it's not a korban. You're allowed to do it. Now when they came to Eretz Israel, according to Rabbi Akiva, it changed. Rabbi Ishmael says, what changed? Nothing changed about Shechita, because when they were in the desert, they could only use Shechita. Now that they're coming right. to Israel, they're going to use Shechita. What's the difference? It doesn't have to be a korban. So, uh, according to Rabbi Akiva, what changed? In the desert, if you wanted to just have your friends over for a little barbecue, you, you just can't do Shechita. Or you, you, could, you do could not do Shechita in the Midbar, according to Rabbi Akiva, unless it was a korban. So you could do a non shechita, but when you came to Israel, then you could only do shechita. Not only, but any time you would have meat, you would have a problem because in the Torah says nevelah trefa. Right. So what's considered a nevelah? What's considered trefa? Right. So, so would it be considered? Right. No. No. So, so the Gemara asks here that question. Right, because it asks, wouldn't it be? Because the question is, ditzan hashochet v'nit nabla biyado. So if a person is, uh, you know, if a person is slaughtering and it becomes nevelah. Okay, or a person who punctures it or whatever. So why doesn't he have, why doesn't he have to uh, cover the blood? In other words, according to Rabbi Akiva, basically what we say in the Midbar, that wasn't considered to be Nevelah. Nevelah was only when it dropped dead. Like a regular, what, what, what Nevelah literally means. Right? Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you killed it according to a recognized way, that's not Nevelah, according to Rabbi Akiva. He would say, in the Midbar. Now it is. Right? So, okay. So, very interesting. So, Rabbi Akiva's position 
you know, always go for the one that makes no sense, right? This doesn't make any sense. You know, it's, it's very difficult to understand. Now, what makes it, what's even more remarkable is Rambam takes Rabbi Akiva like it's obvious pshat. So what does Rabbi Rambam say? I'm going to read to you. It says, when the Jews were in the Midbar, they didn't have any mitzvah of Shechitat Cholin. This is Rambam, Perik Dalet of Ilchot Shechita, in Halacha uh, Yud Zayin. So when the Jews were in the Midbar, they didn't have a mitzvah of slaughtering Cholin. They could do whatever they want. They could slaughter it of Shechita with the throat. They could do it from behind the neck. Like anyone else. That was before there was any halacha. Then... They would say, it's quick, you know, we'll do it quick. I mean, it's, that's a matter of degree, not, you know, not of kind. So, of course, they couldn't torture the animal. And they were commanded in the Midbar that Shechita could only be done for korbanot. Interesting. You want to do Shechita? I don't know why. You like it better? It has to be a korban. Okay? But then, But a person who wanted to just kill the animal in some other way and eat it, that was fine. That was probably fine. There was such a time as a time where it was permitted to eat what we would consider today absolutely trafe meat. Okay? Now, Venitztavu sham. So then when they came to the land of Israel, they had a commandment that they had to do Shechita. They could no longer do Nechira anymore. And that's where we see the Pasuk and Dvarim. Right? That a person has to slaughter and then eat. So it's very interesting. What is this? What is going on here? It's a strange idea. Why did the, you know, so, so everything that we read so far sounded like the issue was about eating meat. Now, and, and moreover, like I, like I mentioned, so what we see here is a breakdown that Ramban is following Rabbi Ishmael. The Rambam is following Rabbi Akiva. Rashi seems, Rashi seems to also lean towards Rabbi Akiva from the way that he explains the Psukim. Okay? So, but what is the idea here? What, is the, what do they agree on? What do they disagree on? So I would like to suggest just a general idea a concept here that really is the common denominator between all of them and it's really the foundation in my mind for all of Shechita and to understand what really what is Rabbi Akiva's logic in particular because Rabbi Akiva's logic seems to defy logic it's a strange why would it be that they would not have to do Shechita they're not allowed to do Shechita outside of the uh, the if today if you told people you don't have to do Shechita unless it's a Korban say thank you I could go buy a giant I mean a giant you know it would be great even so, it is like is, is, there's a Kain of Mikdash yeah. Even when you slaughter, even at, once you're in Eretz Israel, it's almost like there's um, the, the shkta was expanded. Yeah, you can have it however you want, but there's some something there's something special about shkta that you that we are Jews, we eat meat. It separates us from from let's say non-Jews, let's say, kodesh. So and notice that the Rambam says kechol yeah. yeah. They would eat whatever they wanted kechol mm. So. What's the idea? What is really, if we look just at the Torah Shebikhtav, and this is the most eye-opening part of it, and then you can see where Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva fall in this discussion, okay? The fundamental point is that the Torah is trying to make every animal that you eat as much like a korban as it could be. That's the sense that you get. <clears throat> in other words... That's what the Torah is, is struggling with. Now that you're going to be in the land of Israel... In other words, when you were in the Midbar, you were in the presence of God all the time, and you had the Mishkan there all the time. Now you're going to be distant from it. So some way we want to, since you're not going to have a regular experience of Korbanot anymore, because you're going to be distant from it, the idea of Kodesh, we want to incorporate that idea of Kedushah into your regular eating of meat. You see, that's the idea. That's why it's saying, don't eat the blood though, and don't eat the Chalev. In other words, don't eat the parts that would have gone onto the Mizbeach. Even in animals. That Even in animals that, well, animals that are of the species right. that would go on the Mizbeach, don't eat them. And if there are animals that have blood that's similar to animal blood coverings, right? So in other words, there's a connection even in the animals that are chulin back to 
the Beit HaMikdash. You also see this in, particularly on Yom Tov, because the mitzvah on Yom Tov to eat meat is because of Simchat Yom Tov that used to be the Korban Shalamim. We don't have Korban Shalamim, so we just eat regular meat. What? So everyone asks on the Rambam, how could that be the mitzvah? The mitzvah was Shalamim, there's no Shalamim. So the idea is, yeah, yeah, but our meat is as close to Shalamim as you could get. So when you were in the... So that's what we have. We do the Shechita Kasher Tziviticha. The way that the Korban was slaughtered is how we slaughter. The way that the fat of the Korban was removed is how we remove. And why is Shechita done the way it is, by the way? It's done the way it is so that the blood comes out. And what was done with the blood? It was put on the Mizbech. In other words, that's the, the logic of all of these mitzvot and what Book of Dvarim is trying to say is how do you have a situation where people are far from the Beit HaMikdash but the idea, the concept of korban is incorporated into their daily eating, like you said, to keep them an Am Kadosh, to keep them a distinct nation that their eating of meat is still related to the concept of korbanot. But, well, that, okay? ah, but there are two possibilities, two ways of doing it. One way of doing it is by contracting the Mishkan. In other words, the way that Rabbi Ishmael says, is he says, originally all the Jews could eat was, was, was Korbanot. So what is the Torah saying when they came to the Beit HaMikdash? When they came to, I'm sorry, when they came to the land of Israel. Now, the, now the, the Beit HaMikdash is contracted more. You can eat meat whenever you want. It still has to be exactly like a Korban. There's no change in the way you prepare the meat. It's still Shechita like it was before. You're still removing the Chelev like you were before. You're still not eating the blood like you were before. Okay? But now it doesn't have to be actually brought as a korban. So what happened was that a certain amount of the restriction was lifted. The kedusha of the Beit HaMikdash was circumscribed a little bit more. Okay? Whereas according to Rabbi Akiva, it's exactly the opposite. In the, Mishka, in the times of the Midbar, what did the Torah do? It said Shechita can only be in the Mishkan. Now at the time it might have seemed to the Jews like, what's the point of that? But the idea is that Shechita is by its nature a ritual slaughtering. And how do you know that? Because, well, what does the Torah say in Vayikra? That the reason why slaughtering wasn't allowed, how is Rabbi Akiva going to read those psukim of why slaughtering wasn't allowed outside of the Mishkan? Because they would go commune with the demons, right? In other words, it was some kind of a ritual slaughtering. Ritual slaughtering can only be done in the Mishkan. Only in the Mishkan. So then what happens when you come to, the, to Eretz Israel? What does the Torah say? Now, ritual slaughtering is all that can be done. So how does the Torah manage to keep a feeling of Mishkan or keep a feeling of Korban when we come to the land of Israel it's not by constraint, constricting something, it's by expanding something it's by saying that mechanism that was only allowed in Mishkan is now only allowed everywhere, the only thing allowed everywhere, but that's the only thing allowed at all that's why it also says in between that you have to get rid of all of the idols, the idols right, right. Right. right, so there's now that kind of, of, of In other words, uh, that, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. So you're eliminating, in other words, the, 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 the that's a very good point. So that problem of having basar ta'ava or of having uh, slaughtering, whatever you might say it is, outside of the Mishkan because of the attraction of idolatry could still be a problem in the land of Israel if they didn't first get rid of the I idols. Is, you're absolutely is. right. I mean, yeah, no, it still is. It, it, it still is. Hot. Right. Okay. And we, we know Shaul also. Yeah, <laughs> but all they're all 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 yeah. So, so, the, so the concept here is that it's a very beautiful idea that Shechita, when we look at Shechita, what we're really looking at is a ritual slaughtering which is derived from the mechanisms of the Beit HaMikdash. And the purpose of it, essentially, from what we can see from Torah Shebikhtav, whether according to the Ramban or according to the Rambam, was to preserve a sense of Kedusha, even in Chulin, even in the animals that were not actually Korbanot, we come as close as possible to a Korban, even with those animals. That's the, that's the whole idea of it. And so therefore we could see why, as I mentioned in one of the questions, this is why the, um, this is why Masechet Chulin is in the same seder as Kodashim. Why is Masechet Chulin, why is, the, why is the tractate about mundane animals together with all the laws of Korbanot? Because really, it's a derivative. What? Oh, so the one thing that I was saying there was that according to the, so the, the question was how, that according to the Ramban, according to Ramban, the issue was more of an isur of, uh, of eating. Yeah. Okay, it was an isur of eating basar. You, of course you can only eat meat that's slaughtered, that's not a question, but you can't eat basar ta'ava. So it's a, it, really the Ramban, if you were writing the Mishnah Torah, would have put the laws in Machalot Asurot. Because really it was a prohibition on eating. But according to the Ramban, Shechita is a separate thing. 
because Shechita is the mechanism by which the Mishkan's laws were extended onto regular Basah. Okay? So that's, so that's the way that it works. According to Rabbi Akiva, the way that it works was the Torah specifically said nobody can use this mechanism except for the Mishkan. And then when you come to the then when you come to Israel, and now nobody can do any mechanism except for this. What is that saying? Everywhere is the Mishkan, in a certain sense. You're extending the the provenance of the Mishkan to many places by saying that. Okay? Whereas according to Rabbi Ishmael, it was a relaxing of the rule. The original rule was it was actually a korban. Yeah. Now it's virtually a korban because you really are allowed to eat it whenever you want. So it was actually relaxing. Both agree on the concept that the meat that you're eating, in other words, the Torah is clearly trying to convey this idea that the meat that you're eating is supposed to be connected to the idea of a korban. In, and one of the ways in which that's accomplished is through shechita, for sure. The only question is, was that, was shechita, like Rabbi Akiva says, a ri- extended onto all of these animals only when they came to the land of Israel in order to, so to speak, expand the provenance of the Mishkan to every place. In order to emphasize and underscore that idea on purpose so that people would feel that transition from a time where there was a distinction between Mishkan and my personal use. And now there's no distinction, meaning that even my personal use is an extension in some way of Mishkan. Or was it that originally it actually had to be a Korban and now it doesn't actually have to be a Korban, it just has to be like a virtual Korban. Okay, but in both, according to both, there is the idea of keeping the sense of kedusha of Korbanness, Implicit in the eating of the sarfulin. And that's really what we see when we see Shechita. We're going to see this concept come up many times in the Ilchot Shechita that, that, that there's a, a sense of a consecration in Shechita. That there's a, and there's a constant reference back to the halachot of Kodeshim, of, the, of Korbanot, in the framework of Shechita. And we can understand now why. Because according to everyone, this idea of Shechita is really. A, an artifact of, or an element of, the Avodah, the Beit HaMikdash, which is transplanted into Kashrut. And what's the irony of it? What's the only Avodah in the, in the Beit HaMikdash that doesn't have to be done by a Kohen? Shechita. Now you can understand why. Because the Halakha has to be consistent. If, the halach, if really Shechita is going to be a direct borrowing of the Halakhot of the Beit HaMikdash, Right? And we want to take the halakha of the Beit HaMikdash and impl- Im- implement it in regular meat. So if the law in the Beit HaMikdash was that only a Kohen could slaughter, we would have a lot of problems. So you see that the halakha was consistent and made an exception, said that that's not really part of the Avodah. A non-Kohen can also do the Shechita, and therefore it can be transplanted directly, transferred over to Chulin. And that's, that was the halacha that Shmuel corrected Elia Kohen, and they said he's more halacha b'fnei Rabo, the famous Midrash, because he was taking over from the Kohanim. He was, he was supplanting the Kohanim as a religious leader, and therefore he came and said, no, I'm allowed to do Shechita on my own Korban. This is the Midrash. Anyway, the, uh, that's, that's the concept that I wanted to, the broad concept I wanted to start with. The upcoming piece that we're going to do is we're going to start with the first piece in Masechet Cholin. I'm going to send you out the syllabus for the next part. The first three halachot in Shulchan Aruch, which deal with who can slaughter and what are the qualifications of a Shulchan. Okay? Uh, that's the first three halachot of Shulchan Aruch. So Bezrat Hashem on Monday, what we're going to do is the first two dapim, actually, of Masechet Cholin, which are all one sugya. It's very quick, actually. It's very simple. We're going to do the beginning of the tour Bet Yosef in Hilchot Shechita. To, um, to familiarize ourselves with the basic uh, contours of the area. And then on Thursday, we're going to do the actual Shulchan Aruch, Shach and Taz uh, commentaries about this issue. And we're going to learn about the whole idea of certification for being a Shochet and how that evolved historically and so on. It's very interesting. What are the synonyms? 